Professor Megan Davis, uh, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So let's start with the basics here. What is the voice and why do we need it? Yeah, so the voice is um, a mechanism that enables First Nations people to have a voice in um, the decisions and policies and laws made by the government of the day um, and by the parliament. It gets us a seat at the table um, and that's something that we don't have now. Um, and so that's what the voice um, to parliament is in a nutshell. It's not about you know, our mob wanting to be politicians. Um, they don't want to join political parties. Um, it's not about being ideological. They live in communities. Um, they work for their communities. They live their, their whole lives. But they do want to have input into laws and policies because currently that doesn't happen. Um, and that's why we see the situation that we see in Indigenous affairs across the nation. Well, Peter Dutton, as we just heard, he's demanding answers to 15 questions that he's put forward. You were in the meeting the other day at the referendum working group where he was there. Did he ask any of those questions? No, he didn't ask those questions. One of the really important um, parts of that meeting was to explain to him the, where the um, voice to parliament comes from. So we spoke about the 12 constitutional conventions and the national constitutional convention that was held um, five years ago. We spoke about why the voice to parliament was the, the primary reform that came out of that. We spoke about the 12 years of constitutional recognition in this country. So we're in the second decade and went through the, the, the seven processes and 10 reports that exist on this matter. Um, and anchored you know, our conversation and our future conversations in that because it's very important that he understands um, why a constitutional voice is being sought. Mm. Um, he might ask those questions at the next meeting, but it's important to keep in mind that the operating manual of the voice um, is substantially done by um, the ordinary course of parliament, and that is to say the referendum unlocks the door for um, our de democratically elected representatives to, um, mm. to start the process of, of supervising um, the, the legislation or the bill for that voice. Yeah, no, I understand why you'd want to bring him up to speed on uh, the process involved to date. It just does seem a little strange that he wouldn't ask these questions that he has when he's got a lot of you sitting around the table, all the experts on this. Are you confident that he, that he will come back and you will have answers if he does ask those questions. Well, he, he committed to future meetings. Um, and there's, you know, only so far we can go in terms of those questions. I mean, we can't tell you the address or location of the building of what the voice um, will be or what the business cards will look like. We can tell um, only so much in terms of those questions because, of mm. course, if um, the voice is successful, what happens in Australian democracy is there is a process that follows and the inference from a successful voice referendum is that First Nations communities will have some say or a very large say in what that voice looks like and the contours of this voice. So we can't lock down prior to a referendum mm. some of those really substantive questions because you need input from the communities who are advocating for the voice. It's really critical for the voice to succeed, have legitimacy and be durable, um, that communities contribute to that. So there's only so much detail that we can put forward before a referendum, um, and that will be done. That is the purpose of the three committees that have been working mm. since September, who release communiques with information, who will have information ready for when the referendum bill is stood up. Um, that process has been in train. Um, um, for some time. So to be clear, the 15 questions he has, not all of them will or even can be answered before the referendum? Well, some might be able to, but, but the rest need to be answered by First Nations people um, contributing to the design of the voice. And I think most Australians would find that logical and mm. fair. That's how Australian democracy functions. And then from that input of communities, it will enter a normal parliamentary committee process. And then all Australians can comment on what you know, the, the voice looks like. So um, you know, some of the questions will be answered and some can't be, but that's appropriate in the kind of 
um, Westminster democratic system that we have. There are eight principles uh, around this already. Will the working group that you're a part of be putting forward more principles in your final recommendations? Yes, so that's the purpose of the, the working group um, and we have a subcommittee who will add, um, add, you know, likely add to those principles. So yeah, that, that will not most likely happen. Can you give us a sense of what that's likely to involve? Well, it'll be additional detail um, so that, as I said, there's a, there's a, and I think your panel's already spoken about it, there's a tipping point in which there's too much detail or, um, as Dan correctly said, um, there is a risk of the nation voting on a particular model, model A, model B, mm. and then potentially locking in that in a way that doesn't allow us to benefit from the agility of the parliament to change that legislation when we need. I mean, what we need in 2023 may not be what we need in 2053. And so that's one of the important things about the deferral of the detail to the parliament um, is, is that you have that um, possibility to change the legislation. Mm. So um, we will be putting more detail up. There is detail available. Um, there'll be sufficient information for Australians to make an informed decision. The people on this committee are, um, you know, First Nations peoples for, on all three, all two committees actually, who work in Indigenous affairs, have devoted their lives to Indigenous affairs. It's very important to us that Australians are fully informed on this vote. We're acutely aware of the referendum record, but we're also acutely aware of the exigency of this reform and how important it is um, to empower our people to contribute to laws and policies that are made about us. Because right now they're not um, including our voices from right across the country. And in a couple of weeks, David, you're going to see another Closing the Gap report that tells us that we're not closing the gap and, in fact, going backwards in some respects. And all Australians can see that something has to change. This is not like 19, the 1999 Republic referendum where they said it ain't broke, don't fix it. All Australians can see that the status quo isn't working, that something is broken and it needs to be fixed. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we're not going to be in these committees not coming out with the amount of, or the threshold of information that Australians need to be able to make that yes vote. Mm. I think a, a few minutes ago you referenced the Uluru Dialogues and called them constitutional conventions. You've heard the Shadow Minister, Julian Lisa, demanding constitutional conventions before we have a referendum. Are, are you saying that's already happened? Absolutely, it's happened. So we know in the history of referendums that conventions aren't the orthodox way of doing referendums. Um, having, you know, having said that, there are some periods in Australian history um, where we have, have had conventions. Um, but in the, if you look in the Referendum Council report, they're referred to as constitutional convention, conventions and a national uh, constitutional convention. That process has happened. That happened after about seven years in which this recognition process has been in train. And as I said, this is the second decade, the, the, the 12th year of constitutional recognition. Um, so it, it hasn't just come out of, of nowhere. There were really important deliberative constitutional conventions um, that were framed on you know, Australian-based conventions and overseas conventions. Um, so that work has been done. And the Uluru Statement from the Heart is the offer on the table. What is meaningful recognition to you is what was asked of the grassroots communities in the regions. And they said they wanted a more active role in the democratic decision making of the Australian state. That's a really important thing. And so those conventions have been done. The offer is there and we're moving to a referendum and, and we'll see, um, we think Australians will accept this. Um, so conventions have been done and sh I should say that one of the reasons we pursued constitutional recognition um, uh, is because our elders, our old people, um, were around in 67 and they believe really earnestly in the agency of the Australian people, working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to make change. And that, that's what this is about. It's about Australians working together to shape the future. So 1967 didn't have a convention. 
Um, and so um, the conventions have been done and now we will move to a referendum. When you uh, are talking about more detail or more principles coming, um, one of the main elements of the report that was done by Marcia Langton and Tom Karma that's often referenced in this was for local and regional voices. C can you clear this up for us? Will that be something we see more detail around? Will there be local and regional voices as well as a national voice? So um, when you talk to First Nations communities, as, as we have for five years, um, you know, they don't, they don't talk about themselves in terms of local and regional voices. The Langton Calma report is really, really important. Um, and that framework is important, but it's no, you know, people don't think about or talk about the national voice in a way that they distinguish um, local, mm. regional, national voices. The, the voice to parliament isn't going to be a top-down um, mechanism. It's going to be drawn from communities and whether they call themselves, you know, grassroots communities, local communities, regional communities. I made this point to Lisa and Dutton in, in the meeting. We're all talking about the same thing. We're talking about our people in communities, um, you know, doing the hard yards of keeping our people together and flourishing and um, trying to do better for our communities. Um, um, the, the key thing is how do they get that seat at the table, um, and that's what the Constitution oh. is about. It's about not um, allowing the space for politicians to continually silence our voice. It's to mandate it so that we do have a seat at the table to make sure that the policies and laws are of, of a better quality, and they actually result in outcomes, because right now that's not the case. Well, I, I want to come to that. One of the other um, concerns here when it comes to how much might end up before the High Court uh, if this referendum succeeds is that the proposal is for a voice to Parliament and executive government. Uh, the, the concern being that you know, actions of government would therefore be um, litigated in the High Court if, if uh, advice from the voice uh, had not been sought. Why does it need to be a voice to both Parliament and executive government? Well, it always has been. I mean, if you go back to the referendum, you know, council dialogues and, and the report, our people have always spoken about the parliament and the mm. executive together. Um, so the, the parliament is an obvious point. The, the executive is because it's the bureau bureaucracy that drives um, policy in our space. They're the decision makers predominantly in the space. Um, and if we don't have a voice to the bureaucracy, then we're going to have the status quo, which is public servants making decisions about us from Canberra, from regional areas, and not really understanding communities themselves. Hmm. So um, that's not legal, a legally fraught issue. Our constitutional expert group has dealt with that, um, and that will be released in due time. As you know, the detail is arriving, um, and this information will be arriving within the month. Um, and Bob French made um, the statement yesterday. This is the or former High Court Chief Justice. And yeah. an op-ed. Former, yeah, Chief Justice, former Chief Justice of the Australian High Court or High Court of Australia, who said that it's it won't be an issue. So, mm. I mean, but um, will government you know, departments? I think at the end of the day. Sorry, I was going to say, will governments be required to consider the voice? So they're required to listen, hear, and consider the voice. Yes, but there's no entity in the nation that can veto the work of the Australian Parliament. So they have to take it into account. They do. Um, but, you know, they don't have to change the law or policy that they're working on. Um, the really big factor here, David, is that the, it's the, the legitimacy of the voice that's given its power by Australians working together to say to the Parliament and to the government of the day, um, we say that you should have a norm of consultation with First Nations people when you do things about them. Mm. And what we know from focus groups and working with Aussies over five years, they see that as a logical thing. Of course it's going to improve laws and policies and outcomes if you actually have the people who it impacts upon at the table. Final question, uh, Megan Davis. What's at stake here? The consequences of Australia actually voting no, voting to stick with the status quo. You've warned this would uh, risk a, a generation of Australians losing faith if that happens. What do you mean? I think in those comments that I made a few years ago, I was talking about um, how our First Nations peoples had participated um, in this process in the faith that the constitution can change and that Australian democracy can listen to what it is 
um, they say, despite all of the evidence to the contrary. Um, and, and that's what that um, comment was about, about the downstream risks of people who already have little faith in the rule, and law, rule of law and Australian legal and political, um, the Australian legal and political system. But we don't look at it, at the, at it this way, that way. I mean, the way we see it is this is an opportunity for all Australians to shape the future. That's what this is about. Um, we're only focused on the yes. We've always only been focused on the yes. We've spent five years fighting for reform where straight off the bat, a prime minister said no to us. We were disappointed and we woke up the next day and thought to ourselves, let's just turn every no into a yes. So every time a prime minister has said no, every time a minister has said no, we've just taken it as a yes and kept working. Um, so we're not looking at um, any negative consequences of a no vote because it's going to be a yes vote. We believe absolutely, because this has been half a decade since Uluru, um, in the agency of the Australian people and that the Australian people get, they do get this reform. They understand the importance of having a voice at the table and they also understand that nothing has worked until now. They can see that the status quo doesn't work. So doing nothing isn't an option here. Um, and we believe that um, working together with all Australians, it's going to be a, a tremendous moment um, when we're able to alter the constitution um, to open up this future for all Australians. Professor Megan Davis, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me.